Good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for coming today. We'll continue looking at, you know, the uh, administrative level of the church, but you shouldn't be thinking that is just administration. It, you know, as I talk about some of these things, I mean, it really is talking about people in their real life situations. It's just that there's an office that has that responsibility and they keep the Holy Father informed, which we'll see about, and then, um, you know, and see just how the church does respond, you know, uh, in an up-to-date way of what is happening in the church. So today I'm going to talk about some of the offices in the church that maybe are not ones that we hear a lot about, but yet the work they're doing is very, very significant. For example, there is an office in the Vatican uh, regarding health care ministry. Health care ministry. Now that really is two different aspects. One is health care in how we provide it and secondly, how we reflect on it as to whether or not it is something that mirrors God's teaching or it is not reflecting on God's teaching. We're very lucky here in the Diocese of Cleveland. 34 years ago, Bishop Pilla began a medical moral committee, a group of doctors, a couple of moral theologians, a person whose expertise is in, in ethics. And they come together 10 times a year at 7.30 in the morning before they go to work, on their way into work, we have this gathering come together and we deal with questions as to how this um, is seen by the church. In Ohio, we are blessed with some very wonderful health care centers. A few years ago, in one of the areas of Ohio, a religious order of women asked the bishops if they would support three issues regarding health care. They were asking the bishops to support changes in regulations and in laws. I didn't, you know, even think to do anything other than contact the 10 people in the committee and say, next month we're meeting on this subject. And you have to read this material for our meeting. They all came together, they were well prepared, and after two full hours, we came up with what our recommendation was. One of the three things, we supported what the sisters were asking for. One of them, we suggested that it needed some changes so that it would be in accord with Catholic teaching. And thirdly, one we said, you can't save that document. It's too flawed. There's no way you can make it right. Now, I wrote that whole story up and I sent it down to the Archbishop in Cincinnati. And a week later, I got a letter from him saying, I and the other four bishops accept what you had shared with us, that 
None of the other dioceses have a group that that is their contribution to the church. And what we had reflected on, what we had decided would be our best advice, only one thing went to the legislature as is. One thing had the changes that we had suggested, and the third thing still has not got off the drawing floor. Just an example, now on a bigger scale, I mean, they have a much more big and powerful group at the Vatican. But, you know, our little 10 people, you know, we do okay. <laughs> you know, because there are policies now that we have. And over the years, we have, you know, published them for the good of the people in the Diocese of, uh, of Cleveland. Some of the other dioceses have asked if they could use our, um, uh, our uh, texts. And, and, you know, and we have, and we've let them do it. You know, Bishop Pilla and I had, you know, said yes to these along the way. Health, we all know, is a very important part of our lives. The church, by this special office in the Vatican, where its health care ministry is an excellent example that the church is right on the cutting edge of what is happening, and the church is there making recommendations, making sure that it is the moral thing to do. Some of these get very, very uh, complex, very complex, the, you know, the thinking that goes into how do you take this particular situation in a hospital and can we do this? Now, almost every hospital has an ethics committee, but they're not, all, all ethics committees are not the same. I mean, it can be a secular committee. You know, now that doesn't mean they're bad people, but they may not value human life to the same degree as, say, a faith-based ethics committee or a medical moral committee. So there are various ways that things are thought about. And the Catholic Church, first of all, is the dignity of every human person. It is also the rights of people. And that no life is disposable. All of those are very basic Catholic teachings that when we look at an issue, say, in the hospital, or when mom or dad are now getting you know, very feeble and all, and the doctor is suggesting a certain procedure, oftentimes the Catholic thinker look as says, you know, the person is not dying. You know, we aren't allowed to help them along. You know, you, I mean, they have, you know, a right from natural birth to natural death. And without, you know, this assisting someone along the journey. So that's an example of, you know, you got this big organization in the Vatican, but there's an office for that. And, 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 and the church, you know, back in the, uh, the 1950s, through this medical moral committee that went into the 70s, to a large extent, the definition today in the United States of when does death occur was voiced by a man by the name of Robert, and, I, and, and his last name is, you know, escapes me for a moment, um, he was the one that changed the definition. 
the Catholic Church's definition of when there is death. So I think that's a very significant thing, which I'm sure you would all uh, you know, agree in. Another office that may not, uh, it was Robert White. Um, he lived outside the diocese um, on the east side, uh, just uh, east of Ashabula. But Robert White, he was a uh, Nobel Peace, uh, you know, a medicine, uh, you know, recipient. And he figured out what is the best definition for, uh, you know, determining when uh, death actually happens. But there's another group there. Now, this is a different thing, very different. And it's something that we may not, you know, run into often but we're certainly exposed to it or stories about it, and that is inter-religious dialogue. There is, in the Vatican, those things called a pontifical council, and one of them is inter-religious dialogue. Now, in the last, what, three months, four months, we have had all kinds of things on the, uh, on the television, stories in the newspapers about the interaction on one level between the Jews and the Muslims, between Muslims and the free world. And unless you can keep the avenues of communication open, it would be very difficult to have any dialogue or any hope of being able to move forward, move forward in a way that would help a peace process. You know, if you back away from a conversation, you're not going to have much influence. You're just not. You know, then there's nobody there to hear you. You have to remain in conversation, and hopefully as we present our position. I mean, it wasn't that many months ago that our Holy Father invited the head of Syria and the head of you know, the Palestinians and the Jews to Rome for prayer. I mean, that was incredible when you think of it. Everyone else had all these theories and all that. He actually got them to come and talk. You know, I mean, unless we do stuff like that, you know, you know no one's listening to us then. So we have to do our part and then hope as we invite people that they will be part of it. So the interreligious dialogue becomes more and more important now, especially with the increase of violence and you know, aggressive attacks on people. You know, that has to be addressed. You know, you can't just walk away from it, but you have to be able to know what the issues are and know what they stand for, and try to get, engage them in a conversation. Another example, how many uh, of the church trying to do something, and others, you know, in America, in other countries, they go about their life without any real evidence that they're involved. Somehow it'll all be nice. Well, it'd be nice if we do our job well, talking with people. It really will, but just to think that these things happen, it doesn't work that way. Another group that I think is very, very important is one that bombards us every day. Every day. I mean, here I have this little microphone on and Social communications, incredible, for good or for bad. You know, it's not 
a single thing that everything that comes out is good. The way it's used isn't always good. Interesting, at the Second Vatican Council, that would have been in 1964, the second document that was published. Remember, there were 16 documents. The second document was an instruction on social communications. The church was talking about that as a major issue in the 1960s. Now we know in the last 20 years it's exploded all over the place. The internet and you know and all kinds of little machines that sort of run our life, you know? But I'm not sure our life is any better for it. I'm really not. But anyway, I think that social communications it has a value, there's no question. But how it's used isn't always helpful. So there's not only the advance that has been made, but it's how you use it that determines whether or not it is a positive thing or it isn't. I mean, how often now do we hear from parents that their children you know, want to you know, uh, see the internet, want to see, you know, certain things, and never go outdoors to play. You know, I mean, now they, I mean, their lives have changed drastically. You know, I mean, and some of the states re report that with youth, you know, because they're not exercising at all, there's a real issue with obesity. People are overweight. And that has a, an influence on our health. So, you know, none of these things are standalone issues. All of them are interconnected in different ways. And when we realize that, we have to be much more discriminating about what we use, how we use it, and how we assess that it is beneficial in my life, or it is not beneficial. The daughters of St. Paul, who have come here now for a, a number of years, uh, early in um, November, putting on a Christmas concert here and they'll be coming again this year. This is a little, you know, preview. But now, back in the early turn of the century, in the year about, uh, you know, uh, uh, 1912, their founder was talking about instruments of social communication bringing the message of Christ to others. He founded the Order of the Nuns. Their job was to share the message of Christ with others using audio, video, and books. So they were right in there, right at the beginning, and they still do that. Now, the thing that I find very interesting <coughs> is that they, they have taken now another step forward where they have really become quite proficient in how you evaluate social communications. And a lot of the nuns, they go out in New York City, they go to Chicago, wherever, and they teach high schoolers in PSR programs about how do you evaluate the different kinds of social media. I mean, what a gift to the church that they are making themselves knowledgeable and are 
people who are presenting the, the, uh, the way of, of evaluating what is healthy, morally good, etc. So again, social communications back in the 1960s, most people never heard the two words used together. In the 1960s, there was this little Italian priest who put the two words together when he founded the Religious Order of Women, social communications. That is really something that comes in the 1960s, the 1970s. The nuns were doing it 50 years before. Also, as we reflect on, uh, on these various things that the church has um, you know, uh, stressed, you know, for many, many years. Um, for an example, um, it gets some publicity. I don't think enough, uh, but the, you know, the happening called human trafficking. Human trafficking is horrific. It's international. It's taking advantage mostly with young people, but there's also you know, adults who are involved in being misused, but a lot of them are, are young people. And it's not all about the sex trade. A lot of it is, here in Ohio for example, a lot of it is people who came to the United States, they spent all their money getting here and now they don't have any money so someone gave them a job well of course they get so little money that i mean they really are almost working for nothing and people just take advantage of them something that is very real now i had a meeting at the end of last week Sister Kathleen Ryan, who works for the diocese in social problems, had a meeting with two other adults and 11 uh, high school children and, and myself. And we're planning a day-long event for this coming February on human trafficking to teach high schoolers from our Catholic high schools what is, what is happening, why it's wrong, how you can come to learn about it. It's only with education. With education, your eyes are opened as to what is happening two houses down the street. Most people never know what's going on in that neighbor's house. Most people are, you know, innocent in that sense. I mean, they haven't cooperated with it. But, you know, if they were more aware, saw what was happening, they might be able to expose it. And in exposing it, I mean, there are laws against it, human trafficking. Again, there is an office in the Vatican on migration and, and uh, refugees. People who have a burden that the burden is that they cannot remain in their own country. They need to be supported because they get sucked into that whole trade. And so that's what we decided last week that that will be our uh, our big program for this year, trying to um, help uh, high schoolers in our Catholic high schools to learn about it, what's wrong with it, why is it wrong, and how can we combat it. So all these are examples of, on one level, little known offices. And yet each one of those offices is doing something pretty significant. 
in fact, very significant when you think of the people whose lives have been enhanced because of what goes on in those offices. 